two, one. Welcome. Thank you for coming today. This is session four of uh, studying the distance learning playbook. Today we're looking at module seven about planning instructional units. We feel like this is really timely since a lot of folks uh, are, are starting a new semester later this month and um, some of you will have all new classes. So it seems like a good time for a reset and to really um, think about how we might be uh, doing our instru instructional planning a little bit differently. I want to remind you of the norms. Um, so you are in charge of muting yourself and turning off your camera. Um, we like to have the camera turned off in general session, number one, because that just allows you to, to sit back and focus on what's, what's happening um, uh, on the screen with the presenters. And the other thing is, um, this is recorded and posted to YouTube. And if you don't turn off your screen, we get to see everything that you do during the whole session. So just gonna have you think about that. Um, we're asking you to listen with an open in mind. And when we go to our breakout rooms or when we're asking you um, to, to engage in chat, uh, just, you know, do that. Go ahead and engage in a collaborative discussion because that's where we get a whole lot out of this. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping here. As you know, at the end, um, I'll send you the, what you need um, to know about um, uh, giving feedback and getting, um, getting what you need. Um, just a reminder, this is a playbook. Um, it's, it's not meant to be uh, uh, followed from beginning to end, but matching your need with the play that's in here. Okay. Um, I think that uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I think everybody's, you know, pretty comfortable with the norms. And I am going to turn this over to Ashley Clark and, and Kristen Shaw and let them um, introduce themselves and get us rolling today. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Um, last, last presentation, we asked you on a scale of one to cat, how are you doing? And so today we thought it would be appropriate to ask you on a scale of one to squirrel, how are you feeling today? Could you put that into the chat today as we get going? <laughs> I think some fives and eights. Seven, seven looks like he's in pain a little bit. I don't know. I see some threes, a lot of fives, two, eights and threes, seeing some patterns here, excellent. So as you're finishing putting those into the chat, just know that today's agenda, we will be looking at some unit frameworks, both, both the process and the products of designing units um, and planning for instruction in the hybrid and distance environments. Um, and hopefully come up today with some strategies um, for solutions to make some of um, challenges that, that you're having. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Clark. I'm a science educator at RSU 18 at Nokomis High School um, and I'll be one of your presenters today with Kristen. Yeah, I teach eighth grade writing and I am one of the assessment coordinators for our district. Today we will be talking about module seven and we have two learning intentions today. We'll be learning to design experiences that impact student understanding and learning how various strategies align with different aspects of, dif of distance learning. We'll be focusing primarily the first half of this presentation on this first learning intention here. Ashley and I have made for you a, a, a unit roadmap. If we considered our work together today a unit, um, we made for you a roadmap of everything that we will be doing today. And this roadmap, top starts with um, the, the title of our unit. Also detailed in our roadmap today are the learning intentions that we just covered. And so we'll begin today talking about instructional planning by talking, uh, focusing first on this first box of our roadmap, the purpose. Take a minute now to identify an element of learning in your classrooms that students struggle to master. Could you put that in the chat, please? Go 
great. Seeing some time management, revision, focus, analyzing challenging texts, revision, writing complete sentences, student agency, collaboration, being prepared, ex fully explaining quotations and literary analyses, revision, self-assessment, work completion, multi-step directions. There is an element in our classrooms every year that is um, an element of, of learning in our classrooms every year that is a struggle for students to master. And so we, Ashley and I ask you to, to take this idea that you've shared with us either in the chat or even the, the idea, how you would respond to this chat, tuck this away in your mind. This is what we will be coming back to at the end of our session here. Fisher and Frey say, you know, it's important to start with purpose in mind. And, you know, it's, it's easy to think quickly when we're talking about purpose and teaching, it's, you know, the purpose of our instruction or the, or the standards we're teaching or the content we need to cover the, or the skills, you know, our, our content area. Purpose sometimes can be quickly identified as maybe district goals or objectives. Um, but really Fisher and Frey say that um, purpose is, is the why. And that we need to ask ourselves as educators, it's, 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 it's what the students are, are really learning, the skills we, we want them to master. What is it that they are learning in our classrooms that will help them as people, as citizens, will help develop skills that they need to meet goals that they have? Why, are, why is it uh, that we're covering these skills in these ways in our classrooms? And that's what Fisher so to answer that question and help us um, find out why, uh, we're on box two, referring back to our roadmap um, of structure. So our goal here is to um, provide that structure for our students. Uh, before we can even get into that, um, it's important to remember from our previous sessions, um, the idea of balance. Um, so we've talked about engagement, clarity, um, giving um, effective feedback, assessments and grading, and self-care. So in doing this planning, we want to make sure that we're balancing all of these things um, and taking care of ourselves doing so. So the idea is to work smarter, uh, not harder. So Fisher and Frey talk about the pinwheel, um, the instructional framework using the terms demonstrating, practicing, collaborating, and coaching and facilitating. One thing I want to make clear um, in this uh, session is that this isn't a new idea. Um, it's kind of a different term for a strategy you probably already use in your classroom. Um, so you might uh, see this also as the workshop model. So we've included um, this triangle as an example. A wheel, as shown in Fisher and Frey, could also be looked at as the workshop model. Um, where we're building a foundation um, and then working um, to a certain point with our students. Um, and it doesn't always look the same in every classroom. So I know what I do might look different than what Kristen does and might look different than um, another class as well. So we'll give you some insight today on what each of us do and what it looks like for us um, in hopes it'll help you better uh, see how something like this could fit in your classroom. So in my classroom, uh, I teach high school chemistry. This structure for me tends to look um, like this triangle. So first I'm demonstrating with my students, um, then the students are collaborating together, and then we're practicing. So they're practicing individually. Um, and then by the end, they're coaching and facilitating um, each other, but there's a lot of that going on throughout the process as well. In my classroom, I teach eighth grade writing. And so first I demonstrate a writing skill. Students have some time to um, collaborate and work with it a little bit. I give them some feedback on how they're doing. And then I give them time, usually at the end of every lesson to practice that skill um, that, was, that was highlighted that day. So now we wanna give you the opportunity to think about what this might look like in your classroom. So what we wanna know in the chat box is what it's your order. So you could write um, the terms, demonstrating, practicing, collaborating, or coaching, or feel free to just jot down the numbers, one, two, three, four, um, for um, the order that works down, works for you. What this might, what might this look like in your classroom? Sure. 
Sure, I think it could be in a virtual setting or in person. And we'll show you today in the session how person um, and virtual um, hybrid or distance. So I'm seeing um, demonstrating, practicing, coaching, facilitating, and then collaborating. Um, similar to the upside down triangle diagram here. So it seems like people have the same uh, order so far. And I know this can be tricky. Sometimes it's it's a little bit of um, a little bit of everything going on at once. So demonstrating, practicing, coaching, facilitating, and then collaborating. Uh, model guided coaching, and then independent practice. Modeling, guiding, practice, sharing, discussion, feedback, practice, then feedback. Demonstrating, practicing, collaborating, and coaching. Depends on the skill but normally demonstrating, practicing, coaching, and facilitating, then collaborating. So demonstrating, collaborating, practicing, and coaching, and practicing. I like how, too, there's some different terminology here, and I think that's key. Like, we don't want to get bogged down by the jargon um, in this. Um, it's really these this bigger picture, the structure of framework um, that we want to focus on. We hope you take from this session. So Fisher and Frey, uh, quoting from their book, uh, what is most important is the framework that guides your decision-making. So similarly, we wanna focus on the framework uh, to guide us towards that why. And the effect size of teacher clarity that was discussed in an earlier session nearly, nearly doubles our impact on student learning. So if the average is 0.4, uh, teacher clarity will be a 0.75 effect size. So this can be very meaningful. For our students. So referring back to our roadmap now, um, we're moving on to box three. Um, so we're going to get into some samples of what this could look like in your classroom and what it looks like um, in our classrooms. So we are going to break out um, in it's our first breakout room. So kind of a keep in mind our roles. Um, so there will approximately be three people per breakout room. Um, so if someone can be willing to be the facilitator, a timekeeper, um, and then someone kind of maintaining that engagement, these will be for about three minutes. Um, and then our goal in these breakout rooms, you can see Morgan has shared the Padlet in the chat box. Um, so we'll open up that Padlet and you'll see some videos. They vary in length. Some are about two minutes um, to upwards of seven. Um, so feel free to use your judgment um, and watch a piece of one of the longer ones um, if you like, or one of the shorter ones. Um, so once you've watched that video, I'm thinking about how is the strategy similar or different to what you're already doing? What are some benefits of the strategy? And what are some barriers of the strategy? Okay, are you ready? All right, here we go. Um, I've set the timer for 10 minutes with a 30 second warning at the end. So you'll have 30 seconds to wrap up any conversations. And you're up. Hi everyone, uh, welcome back again. Um, so we hope you found that helpful. Um, we wanted to um, kind of ask these questions. If anyone wanted to kind of share out anything from the group in the chat box, uh, feel free. We felt this would be meaningful to look um, at different samples uh, to allow you to see how this might look in your classroom. Um, and also due to the effect size um, that these can have for different students.
We see people watch video one, worked examples, and thought it would be a great exercise for students to explain their thinking. Appreciate the reminder of strategies we've used previously and then forgot about the midst of everything. I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> Looking at text rendering protocol, we like that strategy. Thought it would make sense to review prompting between each step of the protocol. Yeah, and if you liked one of the videos, um, and like Morgan said earlier, these are all, um, they're in the book. They're all just taken from the book, the videos were, but they're also, this Padlet will be accessible to you after the fact as well. So you can explore the other ones that were included if you were only able to watch one. I'm chunking and focusing on what is awesome. So moving forward, uh, we wanted to show why this um, can be so impactful. So the effect size of transfer strategies, um, such as um, the text rendering practice and worked examples, um, can nearly double our impact on student learning um, from the average of 0.4. So this can be very meaningful um, to create um, uh, meaningful learning environments for our students. So now referring back to our roadmap, um, we're gonna jump into the demonstrating box. We're on box four. So in the chat, um, we'd like to know how do I provide students input and information? So what is the way you provide students input and information um, and how do you allow students to demonstrate to others? So what are some strategies you use in your classrooms to do this? We know for some of us, we might be hybrid, we might be fully remote. So this can look very different in different classrooms. So see shared application of a strategy from a lesson with classmates. Showing writing with peers for feedback. And I'm going to show you a little bit of how I do that in my classroom today in a little bit. Modeling mentor text videos and one on one conferencing. Lots of modeling, definitely. So they were co-teaching, grading exemplars. They loved it and learned about the criteria and rubric. Um, That's awesome. I asked students to explain how they solved an issue in their writing or approach a tricky reading passage, modeling videos or book clubs, modeling with think alouds. Yeah, so this can look very different in different classrooms and there's all kinds of strategies that can be used to do this, to provide student input and information. So this might look different if you're in person or distance or hybrid, um, here are some kind of different ways um, this you might go through this phase of the demonstrating. So content delivery, um, either small or whole group, if you're doing this in person, might be through the use of videos or artifacts or non-examples. And through distance and hybrid learning, we can kind of use a mix of all those things. Um, also utilize whole and small group or individual. Um, and then there's different ways of delivering content. So it might through presentations, slide carnival, screencastify, Edpuzzle, Nearpod, uh, Pear Deck, um, PlayPosit. There's an endless amount of um, tools out there for us um, that will allow us to do this. So this might look like direct instruction. Um, I saw in the chat there's a lot of think aloud worked examples, lectures, or share sessions. So demonstrating, as we've said before, um, might look very different in my class than it would in Kristen's um, and in somebody else's. So just to keep in mind, we're gonna give you some ideas of what that could look like. So for me and my chemistry classroom, um, traditionally I would teach how to write lab reports and students do these throughout the year um, over and over and over again to show their knowledge of the content. 
So in prior years, I had a presentation that was more lecture style where I gave an example of what I'm looking for in each section, uh, what you should include in your introduction, your purpose um, for your data. And then I gave an example of each. Um, this worked, but I felt that the students were never really clear um, on what they were doing. And when I turned it over to them to actually write, there was a lot of confusion um, going on and they were not confident in what they were doing. So I restructured the way I teach to follow this model um, through that demonstrating, collaborating practice um, and coaching facilitating. So instead I reformatted it um, to show them what our purpose was, um, would give them guided questions. Then we'd look at examples and we'd grade them together. So I would grade some with them as a demonstration and then would give them the prompt of, I give this a score of blank because give of reasoning and would say it wouldn't be a exceeds or it wouldn't be a meets because and and give them the reasoning for that so i did this i modeled this for them um, and then um, i would allow them to do it on their own as well and when i did this in person the kids had whiteboards so it was really nice they would hold up whiteboards that would say three because not four because so this year when I went to teach, I thought, oh no, I don't know really how I'm going to do this. Um, so I reworked it um, and just changed it a little bit. So this year um, in our hybrid model, um, we, I've used the same model. I've taken what I've put a lot of work into previous classes, but I structured it to work um, for my distant or remote learners. So rather than whiteboards, I use Pear Deck. So I use the same slideshow um, and integrated Pear Deck um, with it. So rather than the students flipping up a whiteboard um, using Pear Deck, they were able to move the little dots to show me what they gave, um, what they thought the score for each would be. And this worked really well. Um, it allowed the students to kind of see where each other was at, especially when some are in the classroom or home. Um, it allowed them to kind of feel like they were all together as all their little dots moved around the screen. Um, and then once we, we could see trends that way, when we could see, um, oh, we're all agreeing this is about a meets level. Um, and it allowed me to see the misconceptions students had. So then I was able to really target those misconceptions in the moment um, and guide student thinking. Um, then they um, were given time to go about this on their own. So I would structure a little bit of time and I would scaffold it. Um, so they were looking at only one section at a time. I mean, that's been very uh, beneficial and very meaningful um, for me um, and for my students as well. And I wanted to show you some comparison of uh, some before and after of what these look like. So this does take a little time um, in the front end. So compared to my original model um, in 2019, for example, in the fall, um, I would go through my, my structure of this is what I'm expecting in your lab report. Here's an example. And then I would take a day to do a lab and a day for them to write reports. Um, so then um, the following year and then this year, I decided to use this workshop model to do it instead. Um, and the quality of work that I've gotten um, has been unbelievable. Um, I do give them prompts, you can see. So this is just one piece. Um, so a sample from fall 2019, when I did it kind of the before way, that traditional model. And then this was from fall 2020, which despite all the challenges that we've had, um, the work and the writing that the students have produced has been terrific and their confidence and their pride in their writing um, has really shown me that this was worthwhile. And it took about five days in the beginning instead of three, um, which I know <laughs> has, uh, was a little hard in the beginning, but over time it's definitely well worth it, um, especially now as students are writing more lab reports, they're becoming very efficient um, in what they're doing. So one key um, thing to think about is when demonstrating in the classroom, uh, one thing that's really important to give multiple examples when demonstrating um, so the students can really put those together and create their own work. Um, also, it's just as equally important to show non-exemplar work as exemplar work so students can really better understand the success criteria 
and there's all kinds of different ways of delivery. So I use Pear Deck originally, um, Jamboard can be awesome, Chatbox, um, any mode that works for you um, can be really beneficial um, in helping demonstrate. Um, and here's another effect size to show um, how meaningful this can be. Uh, these worked examples have an effect size of 0.57. So it definitely has a positive effect on student learning. And direct instruction to kind of accompany that has an effect size of 0.59. And one thing I, uh, thing I think is important to point out is direct instruction not have to be all all class, um, I find it most meaningful when it's in short chunks, um, especially to keep that engagement uh, for our students. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Fisher and Frey also, um, in, they mentioned that demonstrating the skills, the content in our classroom is important, but also we need to give students time to collaborate. And so that's what we'll cover next in our roadmap. I want you first thinking though, how do I structure collaborative tasks for learners in my classroom? Could you put that in the chat to share with us, please? How do I structure collaborative tasks Looking like breakout rooms, protocols, Jamboard, some games, assigning roles. Just let them socialize at the beginning of class. Turn and talk with a partner about a certain topic. Focus specifically on one topic, book clubs, Padlet, Google. Peer study groups, excellent. Reviewing norms, chat rooms. Finding a way for each participant to demonstrate what they've contributed. Sometimes Google slide with a task and instruction to change their background to red if they've stopped or need help before they can move on. Yellow, they going excellent breakout rooms, one to one breakout rooms. Great icebreakers. Thank you. Fisher and Frey say that we can have students collaborate through book clubs, text rendering, protocols reciprocal teaching and jigsaws and having students provide each other feedback in person this in the past has looked like you know a lot of these things jigsaws where students are working shoulder to shoulder where we're conferencing with small groups or with learners one-to-one -one, uh, shoulder to shoulder where they are moving about our rooms freely and following protocols and fulfilling their roles in, in their groups um, collaborating in the large group in the past has looked like whole class discussions or debates seminars any kind of team building or community activities we can still have students collaborate at a distance or in the hybrid environments like you mentioned we can break students out into breakout rooms they can comment on on each other's work digitally they can even provide voice feedback which we saw in session two with a few of those tech tools in the large group uh, we can host virtual classrooms uh, in the large group just like we're doing here with our zoom Students can um, share in, um, can work together in shared applications. A, a lot of the Google Suite applications uh, are collaborative. Uh, some schools have learner management systems that students can collaborate in. And we have uh, tech tools now that we are becoming more confident, competent in using even asynchronously for students to work together collaboratively, Flipgrid, Padlet. Coggle is a, is a tech tool that allows students to concept map together. And Soundtrap is a co collaborative uh, voice recording or music recording um, website. In the text, page 139, Fisher and Frey, they propose to 
us um, a collaborative feedback protocol, uh, a tag protocol, tell your peer or um, group member what was done well with their work, ask them questions about their work and, and give specific suggestions for improvement. Um, I liked this so much, I actually used it in my classroom today. This was this is a screenshot of the work students um, did in their writing class today, giving feedback on our argument writing piece. Uh, here was the roadmap that students are working their way through. And you can, you can see that um, in my class, today we were working in box six of the roadmap on this specific task, uh, the peer collaboration. I've, uh, I've coded the materials uh, with a graphic that is matching the um, graphic in our roadmap so students know exactly what type of materials to work on and in what order. So um, this is the work that we did today, giving writing feedback. Students worked here, um, getting feedback on their writing from multiple peers in, in this protocol. And then at the end of the uh, class period today, because it was the first time I'd used this protocol, I wanted their feedback. And so I sent to them a Google form and I just said, how did it go for you? How was it for you to give and get feedback using this protocol today? And I would say the average score was a four. They found it beneficial. In the past, um, I've taught poetry and I've encouraged students to discuss, you know, the interpretations and their readings in, in groups with the Socratic seminar. And um, this strategy though of, of um, mapping conversations and, and tracking talk um, is not limited to Socratic seminars. So anytime groups of students are working together in a math class, in a science class, in a history class, we can track how the group is doing. And so what I uh, did during this Socratic seminar was uh, we were interpreting a poem and every time someone talked and their student responded, I drew a line to kind of show who was responding to whom. And I coded also their contributions, what type of uh, contributions they were making to the group. And after a couple of minutes, I started to notice some patterns. And so I, I paused the conversation and took a picture of this map and I, and I showed it up on the screen here. And I said, okay, everyone, um, here's your work so far as a group, as you've been collaborating, here's been your talk, what do you notice? And so right away they were able to say, oh, okay, um, I've been talking a lot and so-and-so has been talking a lot. Um, other group members or students in the class were, were able to recognize, geez, these two students are talking back and forth quite a bit. Maybe they should include some other voices into the conversation. Other observations to a, a, a map like this, a, a tracking talk would be, um, I've had students say too, you know, I've noticed that a lot of the contributions so far are adding to the conversation or asking questions, but I don't see a lot of people yet referring to the text or referring to what it is, um, you know, materials that they have available to them. So when we show students how they're collaborating, um, they are able to notice patterns that, you know, we do want them to see. This map was part of a poetry unit that I made so that, uh, again, I threw out the roadmap, I code with images, the, t the materials giving them the same image with where they should be working in the roadmap. And so I mapped for students their talk over the first couple of times, but really by the end of the unit, they were tracking the, their own talk and mapping their own conversations on a similar diagram. couple other uh, collaboration strategies I'd like to share with you. We're going to start with a traverse and we're going to have a couple of different discussion points that you're going to talk about with different partners. A traverse is a tool for facilitating talk. The first thing we would do is children line up and face each other. You could give a talking point and then they discuss. First talking point, wheelchair users can't play sport. I disagree. Partner A needs to say something and then partner B responds and partner A feeds back and then the traverse moves along so they work with different partners after that. Our next talking point is boys shouldn't wear pink or play with dolls. Off you go. Traversing works really well 
for making sure children have a range of different talk partners very quickly, developing that ability to speak and to question and challenge is really important. This reminds me of um, the, um, although, although we, we don't have the ability, you know, to have them to stand face to face, just like we saw in the video here, we can shuffle and reshuffle groups in our breakout rooms. One more collaborative strategy I'd like to show you called the bean critique. And Ashley, this reminds me of the strategy you used with your pair deck, drag the dot to vote on a score. Take your computer, open it up so that everyone can see your work. We are going to do a bean critique. So the bean critique is one way of students giving feedback and receiving it. When a peer gives them feedback, they think about it a little bit more and they're more accepting. So the students are given two beans. You will go around and you will look at each person's web page. And I only want you thinking about the aesthetic look, color, font, family, size, and the text alignment. They will observe all the pieces. And then after they've seen all of the work, they place two beans on one person's work, or you can pick two people's work. And then we look at the pieces that receive the most beans. I thought it was really colorful. The fonts draw you in a bit more. The students are seeing work that meets a goal and how they can change their work so that it is better meeting the goal. Okay. And Ashley saw us already how to do that digitally with her pair deck to drag some dots. Uh, we've seen Patty in um, previous sessions use Zoom to stamp uh, votes. So that's another way to, to take the strategy of collaboration and apply it to our digital setting. We're going to start with a traverse. Take your computer, open it up so that everyone can points. see your work. <laughs> you know, a lot of us also mentioned that while students are, um, while students are um, working collaboratively that you, we give them protocols. And so here are a couple other simple protocols. Um, this first one here is from Rumberger at High Tech High. Uh, it's very simple. It's um, for students to, to be, give a, a kind remark, a specific remark, remark and a helpful remark to their peers. While students are working, they can also use a tuning protocol from Jess Hughes. While they're working on a project, review, overview the project together, ask each other some clarifying questions, probe some questions, discuss, reflect, and debrief. The effect size of small group learning and cooperative learning you can see has positive impacts on, on, um, on students. Oops, sorry. All right, Ashley should be all set. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so as you can see, we're moving through our roadmap. Um, so now onto box six, coaching and facilitating. Uh, if you can share in the chat, um, how do you guide your students thinking? So what are some strategies or ways you guide student thinking in your classroom? Pointed questions. Thank you, April. Individual conferencing, praise, catch next steps, Padlet, embedded questions in the text, probing questions, prompts. I might reference an anchor chart. Those can be very helpful. Exit ticket, as we've seen, and Kristen used one um, in our example earlier. Ed puzzles, stop and ask questions to respond, asking questions and listening. Hair deck, Jamboard. I know I use that a lot in my classroom. Reference tools attached in Google Classroom, anchor charts, prompts, checklists, rubrics, bringing us back to protocol, ask us what, how X applies. Awesome. So we have all kinds of tools in our tool belt to allow us to do this. 
Um, so looking through coaching and facilitating, um, we all have kind of different terms for these things. It might look different in person or distance versus. So there's scaffolding, prompting, and questioning that are kind of the big overarching themes we can look at. When in person, we might be looking at examples, non-examples, or taking an inquiry uh, approach through coach uh, through conferencing. Uh, we can also do this and by using success criteria and learning goals. And through the distance and hybrid model, we can do some of those as well. So we can still give examples and non-examples, um, chat box um, and back channels. Um, and today's meets our tools. I know Kristen filled me in on some of those um, that I know I wanna try in my classroom where um, it allows the students to talk amongst each other um, and ask questions and communicate um, so then we can kind of check on them after the fact and to keep that conversation going, which I know um, this can be very difficult <laughs> with distance and hybrid learning. Uh, individual uh, or independent breakout rooms to allow uh, that coaching and facilitation to happen. And again, looking at success, success criteria and learning goals um, can be used or distance hybrid uh, learning as well. So I'll give you some examples of kind of how I go about this in my classroom. Um, I'm always coaching and facilitating throughout the process. Um, and some ways I scaffold and prompt my students is when I give them their lab reports, um, I always tell them I don't want them starting with a blank piece of paper uh, uh, for this year. I give them a template. So in my template, I have headings for each of their sections. Um, so I pulled one example um, from just the purpose section. Um, and then I give them prompts underneath or sentence stems, um, depending on the class. So the question for the purpose might say, what are we trying to learn by doing this experiment today? Um, then underneath it, this was a lab about physical and chemical changes. I asked them to define and give examples of those. And then the students were able to then write um, a more um, um, complete purpose using those prompts. I also provide them a rubric. So you can see on the right side, um, this is it's like success criteria, this is what we use. We really analyzed earlier that demonstration mode. Um, and I use Pear Deck this year. I found that helpful to allow them to really understand the success criteria um, and see what they needed to do um, to take their writing to the next level. I just dropped these circles in. I put this on Google slide and I asked them to grade themselves and then I grade them as well. Um, that keeps that account going also. So through this process, this is kind of what it looks like. So this is from like this year when I used Pear Deck, um, they go through that demonstrating mode, um, but then they also have access to this afterwards. So they have this resource available to them where they can look at examples, see how they grade it. And I scaffold it um, by don't ask them to, don't ask them to write the whole report report at once, but do it in each piece. Um, so we looked at the purposes and then we took some time and we wrote a purpose. Um, and then they kind of helped each other out or I might go around and coach and facilitate. And then we moved through all the sections of the lab report that way. Um, it kind of chunked it up for students. It made it a little less intimidating. So by the end of that process, they've completed a whole lab report. It gives time to reflect and look at that on their own. And then I ask the students to be the coach or the facilitators. And this allows me to do some differentiation as well and help students that might be struggling a little bit more. So once their lab reports are written and we've gone through this protocol, um, then this year, because peer review seemed like it might be a little difficult, um, I made a shared document. So I made kind of a little spreadsheet um, and I would link in their work. And when I did that, I made it anonymous. So I did this for a couple of reasons. Um, my big uh, reason was I don't get a lot of communication with my high schoolers um, every class. And I really wanted to build their confidence um, in their writing. So um, I kind of made this mock um, template here. So what I would do is I'd link in their, their lab reports, but I removed their names. And then I put two students' names next to it where a rubric was linked in, just like the rubric um, we had analyzed and looked at or the success criteria we had looked at. I asked those two students to read that one lab report and give them feedback. After they did that, I released their names 
Um, and then they were able to see, oh, if I'm Mary, my lab report was 11B. And when they clicked on that, they could then look at their own lab report and see the feedback their peers gave, gave them. Um, this definitely helped um, build their confidence um, it allowed them to kind of get used to communicating with each other and giving feedback in a way that was structured um, to the point that over time I've been able to kind of release that and allow them to peer review um, with more confidence and a little less structure. Um, so by doing that, they become the coaches, they become the facilitators, and I give them lots of options. So I also scaffold this. Um, um, by giving them these prompts as well. So I gave them the rubric and then the second page <clears throat> was the slide that said these prompts here uh, for warm, cool, or clarifying feedback. And these are some examples from my students um, of what they wrote about their peers' work. Um, I know when I first looked at this, I was a little blown away um, and felt like it was very meaningful, the feedback they were giving, it was effective feedback. Um, and they not only learned from reading their peers and getting new ideas of how they could go about writing their reports, but at the same time, they were getting um, feedback from their peers as well. Um, and I gave them options. They could do it that way, or they could leave actual comments in the document. A lot of kids did a little bit of both. Um, so I felt it was important, especially for my high schoolers, to give them options of what worked for them. Um, and they were able to give each other feedback and then look back at their own lab report um, and use that to improve their writing. At the end, they graded each other's. Um, so we had graded lab reports as a class, um, as a demonstration, um, then they grade their own, grade their peers, and then when I go and grade them, um, it allow them to really better understand the success criteria. And we do this, we write about typically about eight uh, to 10 law reports a year. This year might be a little less, um, <laughs> but this would allow them to really get more comfortable with this. And I can say that from the law reports, the, I think I'm on lab report number three now um, with all of my students. Um, they've just gotten better and better as the years go, goes on. And I ask them for feedback very uh, quite often. Um, and they have expressed that their confidence in writing these reports um, is so much higher than it was at the beginning of the year. I do think this has been a huge part of that is giving them time to reflect and peer review and coach and facilitate each other has been really meaningful for them. So go back to this effect size um, for peer tutoring. Um, like I said, I can see it in their confidence, their pride in their work. Um, but we also can see that peer tutoring has an effect size of 0.55. And thinking back to Brandon's session earlier on, um, the importance of effective feedback. So that high information feedback um, can have an effect size of 0.66 as well. So combined, this can be really meaningful for our students, whether it's remote, um, hybrid, or in-person learning. Fisher and Frey also want us giving time for students to practice their new learning, practice these skills. And so in the chat now is your time to, to think and to share with us how do I ensure students practice and apply what they have learned? How do we, how and when do we give students time to practice and apply what they've learned? Bring us back to protocol, how X applies, give them time in class, multiple chances to show understanding, making the time, going through the process, using the writing process, using the, the, the scientific process, formative work, quick turnaround feedback, practice in class, multiple chances, multiple formats, and feedback. How do we ensure students practice and apply what they have learned? 
Fisher and Frey say that it is so important that we do exactly what you've just said, build out intentionally during our instruction and during our design of instruction or units that we give students simply time to apply what it is that they've learned. That they've learned. We give them um, space to practice and deliberate practice. And we'll, we'll look at some examples of that here in just a minute. You know, whether we are in person, at a distance, or a little bit of both, when it comes to practicing, we need to be doing these things in, in all settings, showing students examples and non-examples so that when they practice, they know uh, the goal that they are, are trying to achieve, giving them the success criteria and the learning goals for their journey on the way, making their learning relevant to them, giving them time to, to focus very narrowly on very specific skills with specific feedback and being intentional about our design. And this year, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling it more than ever, every minute counts when students are here and so we have to be so intentional about what is it that they are doing in our seats uh, today and what is it that I need them to continue working on for at-home learning tomorrow. Again, in our writing class this unit, we're, we just finished box three last week drafting our argument pieces and I just wanted to show you um, setting up my Google Classroom to kind of align to this roadmap. I ass make assignments um, named after the box that they should be working in and when students were working in box number three, they could see um, you know, all of the materials that they would have needed or some of the practice we would have had. Part of our work in drafting arguments was a very narrow and specific look at writing introductions. How are they structured? What patterns did we notice? And then how, how now can we turn around and write our own? And so we, we took some time to very narrowly look at a specific skill for students so that they could eventually meet the learning intention detailed for them in that assignment. This type of practice is very narrow. It's a deliberate practice focusing on a deliberate skill for a deliberate purpose. And so over time, part of our design too, Fisher and Frey say, is that even though this unit in uh, their draft learning how to write introductions, we very specifically and deliberately practice that skill. In a couple of months, um, when we come to box three of the next unit, guess what they'll see again? They'll have an opportunity to try some of these strategies again, deliberately. Both times we're practicing uh, intentionally um, this, this specific skill, and in, in this case here, it was writing introductions, but when we deliberately practice the same skill over time, we call that spaced practice, inter interval practice too. As you can see, spaced and deliberate practices have high impacts on learning, uh, almost, almost close to double, um, double the impact. We have looked at today learning how to design experiences that impact student understanding. And we did this first by looking at the model that Fisher and Frey present with this pinwheel. At the heart of the pinwheel, at the heart of our work for instructional design is our purpose. And as we move students towards this purpose, we want them um, being demonstrated the skills, demonstrating them themselves what they can what they know and can do. We want students collaborating and facilitating, co coaching um, and practicing. And for, for all of us at different times and in different ways, that order is different and that's okay. We'll wrap up now with this final learning intention, how, to, uh, how these various strategies align with different aspects of distance learning. We've covered some of that here already, but we'll start to wrap up our work together in our, in our unit, looking at box number eight now. At the beginning of this presentation, you were asked to identify an element of learning in your classroom that students struggle to master. Teachers must consider various ways and times that students will access the class, the learning, our instruction. And it's been difficult for a lot of us to balance what is happening synchronously and asynchronously. So we're asking you now in our final breakout rooms to take that struggle, take the struggle with you into that breakout room. Identify an element in your classroom that students struggle to master. Share that struggle with your colleagues. 
and maybe based on some of the strategies that you've seen or um, some of the design that Fisher and Frey are asking us to include in our instruction, demonstrating, collaborating, coaching, practicing, um, what are some ways or what are some new angles we can work to hopefully solve some of these problems? Do you have some new strategies for each other? Do we need possibly to reorganize our triangle or our order in which we design our instruction? Or do we just need it to refine our approach? And so these next 10 minutes in your breakout room is your time to problem solve with colleagues, bring your struggle to them, and then see if you can come up with a solution. Okay, here we go. Great. Thanks everyone. Welcome back. Um, we will share out here in just a minute on some of your conversations. So hold, hold your thought there uh, in, for just a minute. You were asked in your breakout rooms to look at or try to identify a struggle that you're having for, for students uh, in your classroom and uh, when it comes to instructional design and then share your struggles. Could you problem solve? And we're going to come back to your solutions here in just a minute. Um, today, here are a few of the tools that we used, but instead of a breakout room, we'd like to give you five quiet minutes now to um, reflect on a breakout document. And this will be a place, an organized uh, shared space, an organized place, but a shared space for you to do a little bit of reflection in one of three ways. These three documents are linked for you in the Padlet shared for you at the beginning of this presentation. They are essentially, all three documents are essentially asking you to reflect on the same things. Um, what, what types of, um, based on some of the strategies you've seen today for instructional design, what are some things you might maintain or modify? What are some things you might stop, start, or continue? What are some things today that changed or challenged or confirmed your thinking? And so when you get to Padlet, you'll notice in the top right hand corner, once you, once you decide which document to reflect on, you might, um, you might need to open the document in a new window to modify it. So Morgan, could you set a timer for us and um, call us back in about five minutes? If you finish early, take some time to browse all the documents and see the thinking of your colleagues. Kristen, just to clarify, anyone can choose which document to write in, right? Correct.
Okay, it hasn't been quite five minutes, but I would like to bring us back for the final words. Great. Thank you, Morgan. As you are finishing up, I'd like you to take a notice at the picture in the top right hand corner of your document. Uh, you should see a light bulb in that reflection document and that was by design. Um, that was to um, to show that when we, we were working in box number eight to you, we were reflecting on our learning during this portion of our unit and um, the image on the um, worksheet was the same image as the box in our roadmap. And that's to indicate to learners that we were working on the right material at the right time. And so how we will choose to celebrate, how we'll choose to finish up our unit is to celebrate some sort of showcase or um, celebration of the hard work and the thinking, the summative of um, our work here. And so, um, just as a reminder, we're learning how various strategies align with different aspects of different learning. And one strategy, um, just one of the strategies we highlighted was um, the use of the roadmap. And so before this session, before your reflection, you were asked to um, think about a struggle and bring it to your group and uh, try to problem solve. And this is the highest uh, high impact strategy with with the highest effect size John Hattie um, lets us know that collective teacher efficacy when we uh, use the genius of other educators to solve problems we bring our problems to others that um, really these have the greatest impact on learning and so we've done that here today through our small group our problem solving and also through our reflection so excellent let's wrap up our unit today uh, with box number nine and celebrate to showcase your work and your thinking. And one thing we wanted to uh, point out to you guys, please remember we've, we've come a long ways. Um, so I know for fall 2020 or maybe even spring of last year, we were building the plane as we were flying it. Um, so our goal is that in doing, going through these sessions, um, we're getting a little bit more, um, we're, our plane's getting built a little bit more. We might not be quite professional pilots yet, um, but I know we've been tweaking along the year, uh, along the way as we've gone. Um, and we're hoping this session allows you to feel um, more in control uh, of your teaching and with some new tools under your belt um, to really make some planned units for your spring semester or the second half of your year um, to provide that structure and framework for your students to be successful. And as Morgan said, uh, if you can fill out our, the feedback form as well uh, as a way of celebrating um, today. So for box number nine today, what we'd like to do is just celebrate you and celebrate um, maybe the struggles that we've had and some possible solutions. And so this is always the final box of every unit that I do with students to somehow say thank you for all of your hard work. And that's what I'd like. To, that's what we'd like to do with you today. Um, we'll celebrate simply by opening the floor to you. Uh, would anyone like to share any um, answer to this question? What struggle did you have that now may have a solution? Let's let's celebrate and showcase some of our work today. You can definitely go ahead and unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to share, um, I work with our, our K to eight remote team um, in my role this year. And I love the strategies here. And I was just working with a teacher who was struggling with um, unit design. And I love the tiles. They match what I, I build on their website. So there, I'm so excited to bring some of these tools back and to share this with my teams um, so they can think and a little bit modify a little bit or or again, also recognize the hard work that's already been done this year. This is amazing work you have shared and, and I'm extremely grateful for all of these um, examples that you've, you know, you've shared with us and you've talked it, you've given us time to reflect on that. Outstanding work today. What else can we celebrate today? 
Um, I would share that um, I was struggling with coming up with ways for kids to virtually collaborate. And I have some nice ideas for kids giving peer feedback on the writing that I plan to use. Thank you. Celebrate that. What else can we celebrate today? I think that, uh, I don't know if it's celebrating, but I, I, I feel like I constantly forget to give kids time for practice. Um, I think we switched to semesters this year and I feel like, and I, I bet you a lot of teachers in my district feel like this too. Like I, I feel like I'm shoving as much material down them as I can because I'm so worried that they're not going to get what they need, that I'm forgetting that they're not they aren't getting what they need because I'm so focused on how much I can get done and I need to slow down and realize that it's so it's only six it was, so it's only two quarters well it's only two quarters and I can only do what I can do and that's that's I think that's a good this was really timely for me so I, I appreciate that very much great let's take one more celebration what else can we celebrate today what struggle did you have that now may have a solution I'll share one that's, it, it wasn't a struggle for me, but I'm anxious to share the whole um, process of the writing the lab reports because I think kids struggle so much with that across the board, um, across the sciences. I'm, the, I'm a literacy specialist and I get asked by teachers a lot, science teachers, and I think those are some great strategies. I love the peer coaching and the feedback. I thought that was great. Great. Thank you, everyone. If you would like to share your celebration, uh, could you please put that in the chat before you go today? We're so honored uh, to be able to work with you today. Thank you for being with us. As a reminder, we have just finished a whole unit together, um, our instructional plan planning module seven unit. This was everything that we got to do today together. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Ashley and I will be here for a few more minutes if anyone wants to hang on. Thank you. What a, a fantastic job you did. That was just spectacular. It's amazing um, how much you were able to accomplish in 90 minutes. This is fabulous. It shows us that it really can be done. Thank you. I know for me, just making, doing all this made me, it made me a lot more reflective in my teaching and it's, it's changed a lot of what I've done. Um, so it was definitely time well spent. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording now, bring that to an end.